Just glad, to, glad that you're in our life and I hope you feel the same way. You know, it's nice to have people in your life. What is life if you don't have people in it? We're family. And you know, these, these are your brothers and sisters sitting next to you. That's what the Bible calls them. And uh, they're eternal friends. And I always say it's not the friends you make, it's the friends you keep. And uh, the long-term friendships of people. And we're all so different, but yet it's God that brings us together. Only God could make so many different people. <laughs> I'm teasing, but you know, you ever meet two people, they're, they're, they're alike, but they look alike, but they don't sound alike when they start talking. So you, everybody is really, really different, and yet God has placed all of us on this planet to work together for his, his purpose and to bring him glory, and we're all so different. Sometimes you wonder, you know, amen. Sometimes you can wonder in your own house. You know, when my kids were little, I thought that Jody and Michelle, when they're little, little babies, you know, I didn't know any better. I looked at Michelle, and I thought the next one's going to be like her, and they weren't even close. I mean, it was volumes away, and I'm thinking, no, way, that was a mistake. <laughs> they're not even, because people are really, really different. Amen. We need to find the good in people, right? The gifts. That's why God made all those nationalities and races, because there's something in them that they have to give to the, to the world and to the kingdom. It's a deliberate. Difference is right. Amen? Amen. God did it all on purpose. Well, we're going to talk about healing tonight. This is just a one-night thing, but, you know, and eventually in your life, you will, you will need to learn about healing. Um, at least most people have to. And the world, you know, I was thinking today of how many, you know, have been overseas to India and, and Kenya and Bulgaria and Romania and it's amazing to me how many doctors the United States has and hospitals and drugs and yet it seems to me there's more sick people here almost sometimes than there is anywhere in the world and you wonder you know about that and I think a lot of it is because we have moved our focus from God healing us to depending on physicians and so we have let our faith diminish just like, uh, if you notice, I don't know if you notice, but it seems to me that people don't talk about miracles as much as they used to. <clears throat> I think that when you get in a place where you need a miracle, then you start to pray for one. But if you have another alternative besides a miracle, you, you just go for the easiest route, the path of least resistance. And I think that you need to train your members to go forward and train yourself to put God as your first answer in everything. Now, I know that sounds right, but how many people actually do it? You know, how many people actually do it? And see, your mind gets renewed to the kingdom instead of the world. The world has its way, and that's okay, but God has a greater way. And, and I think that if you can begin to chip at that, do you, especially you young people, when you're young, you don't think you need it. But in, when you start to have adult responsibilities and not a lot of alternatives, you begin to look for, for God to help you. I, I wondered, you know, I've wondered, like, it seems like the, the, what they call the millennials or the younger people, they sometimes don't seem to think, or think, maybe that's how they see it, but they don't think about God being first and they're not as interested as in church as, as the older generations. And, and it's not a slam on millennials. You know what I, I'm beginning to observe? And to me, a lot of it is they haven't had to. They, the, uh, the, the nation has so many programs and so many alternate ways to get your needs met that you just don't have to think that you're going to need God to help you or it's not going to work. And, uh, and like I said, when you go overseas... You know, I never saw any, any, any uh, programs in Kenya. You know, when I was near the, the Somali border, I told you this one time, a guy got his leg broke and he, he sent for money. And when we sent him money, by the time he got the money, they had to go break his leg again because it had healed wrong. By the time he got there, the hospital was 700 miles away. Well, you know, that'll change how you think. It'll make you pray more. And... Uh, 
even where this village was. It's funny, I'm bringing this up because I just, I've been wanting to get a hold of those people and I found two files today while I was looking through stuff in the church and one of them was his name and one of them's the other guy's name and now I'm gonna get to contact him and I've been wanting to contact him and I thought I had no way. But anyway, it was in Pecatoni next to the Somali border and the Somalis would come down and do raids and they established a village if the, the government told them, if you can keep this land, then you can have it. So the government let them have it if they, if they could occupy it because it was dangerous. And also they had wild animal problems, you know, baboons and snakes and stuff. And anyway, the guy went there, his name is Zebedee Mina, and they started a church there and it grew to, the, the community grew to about 1,100 people and there was other denominational churches there. And they did occupy. But I thought, you know, I don't know about you, but if you had to go out in the dark in Africa with no electricity, in the, when I say in the dark, the darkest Africa where there isn't anything and deal with baboons and snakes at night and wild boars and stuff, stuff like that, that's a real challenge. But those people did it by faith and, and they had the baboons wonder, were wanting to take over their uh, village. Now, you might not think that's a real bad uh, problem, but the baboons stole all their food, ripped everything out of their houses and threw it all over the ground. And they started to hunt baboons because they had to get rid of them. Now, these guys hunted for baboons from midnight to like 4 a.m. because that's when you could get them. So they went out in the dark with spears, with the snakes, the boars, the elephants, the tigers, and the lions to kill baboons in the dark with, with some kind of lantern. Not one man was lost. Not one man was injured. And they killed over 1,500 baboons. And uh, that, those, those are, that's bad. When you go out in the dark with a spear, in Africa, in the bush, you bad, you bad. You pray and you bad. <laughs> you got both things. But anyway, it's a, it, what the point of that was, they had to pray and become dependent on something besides the government, the power company, and the police and the army because there was nobody there to protect them and nobody there to help them. So they learned to pray and uh, he developed a community there and did a great job. Well, you might say, what's that got to do with healing everything? Because your faith has to do with your healing. And I, you know, this sounds funny, but sometimes I think a really bad report is better than a mediocre one because it'll make you pray. If it's something you think you can get through, you're not as, you're not as fervent to pray. I really think that the peril the nation was getting in in the fall is why the Christians prayed and turn it. It took almost it took almost being toast for the Christians to pray. So if you can live with it, you tolerate it. But if it's an extreme thing, you begin to pray, right? So first thing you have to settle is the will of God. Okay? If you don't have that settled, you don't have a foundation. Now a sinner can't be saved until he's fully convinced that it is God's will to save him, right? Right? Everybody should say, right, Paul. Right, Pastor? Okay. Now, that means faith begins where the will of God is known. If you don't know the will of God, you can't have, have faith for that situation. That's why it, the will of God, knowing the will of God is what you get your fight from. <clears throat> if you know you're supposed to be married to somebody and the devil tries to ruin your marriage... If, it's the, if you settled it that it's the will of God that you're supposed to be married to them, you are standing on something. But if you are lawful in whether, you know, it's good, maybe, maybe I messed up, you begin to create doubt and you begin to give cracks in your faith. Same with your businesses, your health, or whatever. So faith begins where the will of God is known. Faith must stand by itself, not on what you think or feel. Faith has to stand on God's word and God's will. You, if, you are, if you are analyzing your circumstances, 
That's okay, but you're letting in another system into your mind. Faith relies totally on the will of God. End of story. Not what you feel, not what happened to your father, your mother, not what happened to anyone. Your faith stands on the will of God. Uh, not on your circumstances. If, you know, in any area you, that you do this in, you can look pretty crazy, but if you got it, it doesn't matter how crazy you look. It'll come to pass if you got it. Now, this isn't head stuff I'm talking about. This is the stuff that's down in your inward parts that you know. Your head usually tells you something else when you have this kind of faith. Because this is the faith in your spirit, and your head is doing the reasoning, but your knower tells you how it's going to come out, and that's what you go for. Because your head doesn't always match what you believe. Now, you might think that's crazy. It's not. Have you not had to battle your head if the devil's trying to tell you you're not going to get healed and your faith is believing it is that you hear one thing with your head but you hear something else in your spirit? Has that not happened to any of you? If it's not happened, then you have to ask God about it because your spirit is connected. Your head is not always connected to the will of God. If you think your head's connected to the will of God, more than likely you're in you instead of God most of the time. I have felt one way and did another a million times because I heard it down in my inward parts and my, my head did not always bear witness with my spirit. Sometimes I had to do what my man of God told me in spite of what I thought completely. Sometimes when my younger years, Dr. John would tell me something, he wouldn't tell me I had to do it. He would tell me what he heard. And there's a difference between him giving my, his opinion and what he heard. When he'd tell me what he heard, sometimes my feelings did not match anything he told me to do. But I would do it by faith. And it would work for me and I would get the results. And then I would see afterwards what got done. That's why the Bible says, believe the Lord God's prophets and you will prosper. Amen. But you have to be able to put down what you think and see, that means that's a whole different theological issue, but you realize you've got to trust that God can work through men. And what the devil will tell you is the man's not perfect. He did this wrong. He's, I seen him hollering at his kids. He does all these things wrong, so he really doesn't qualify to be your leader, and I'm going to think for myself. <clears throat> It's not going to work. God, you know, Moses had an anger issue. David killed a guy, you know, took his wife. I need to know these people that did everything right when they led. Because I don't know, I don't see anybody that did it. So people were led by people who were imperfect. The, the deal is, if you don't know the voice of, of your own, if you don't know that spiritual voice down here, you won't recognize it no matter whose mouth it comes out of. You have to be able to, be, your spirit must bear witness with their spirit. Your spirit must bear witness with what they say. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Caiaphas prophesied and said, It's better for one man to die than many. Caiaphas didn't even know he was prophesying. So here again, if you're looking for the perfect spiritual situation, Caiaphas was a heathen, really. He was a, a, a Pharisee, but he was saying something that he didn't even know he was prophesying when he said it. So you wouldn't believe it, but it was true what he said, that it's better that one should die than many. So you're listening for the word that you hear out of the people that God has placed in your life. <clears throat> it's very important. It might be something that you have to think about or take to God, but you've got to learn the voice of God. That's why I told you at the prison, the biggest compliment those guys could pay me was they said they learned to hear the voice of God. I asked them about five years ago. I said, what have you learned? And, I, and they didn't give me some big theological answer. They just said, we have learned the voice of God. 
And I thought, my goodness, that's perfect. You've heard me say that before. If I didn't leave you with anything, and I, because see, I'll diminish someday, I'll die. But if you can hear the voice of God, I know you're going to be all right. Because it'll come through me, it'll come through somebody else. Amen. Turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And there came a, a leper to him, beseeching him, kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou will, thou can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and said unto him, I will thou be clean. Now, What's the first thing Jesus did? He really corrected his theology first. He said, I will. Now, a lot of times when you're praying for people, they want to tell you what they think. And if you go to adjust their theology in the middle of the healing line, they get upset because you didn't say what they wanted. They wanted you to agree with them but Jesus adjusted this man's theology before he did anything. He corrected his thinking. Now, he said, I will. The will turned the if to a yes. Did you hear me? The will, when he said, I will, it turned his if you want to, you can heal me. It turned that if to a yes. It removed the doubt. That's a big deal. Because sometimes you're not sure, but God may correct your theology so he can deliver the package. The New Testament, we know this. Every time Jesus was asked for healing, asked for healing he healed him. God did not, does not promise our bodies won't die, right? He says it's appointed unto every man wants to die. This is, this is all foundational theology that will help get you a good foundation for the next level of revelation for your healing. He promised that he would remove sickness and disease. He never said we wouldn't die. He said, I will, remove, I will bless your bread and water and remove sickness and disease from your midst. He didn't say you wouldn't die. He said, you don't have to be sick. Hallelujah. It turns to Exodus 23, 25. I want you to read it for yourself. Now, this stuff sounds fundamental, but I think when people are fighting a disease without this underneath them, I'm not sure you do so well. I'm so big on doctrine. When I say doctrine, I don't mean like religious doctrine. I mean that your doctrine's right, so you believe right. Not, be, not to make you like a, a Pharisee or a doctrinal wizard, you know. I'm talking about where you pray according to the word instead of what you think. 20, 23, 25. And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and water, and I will take sickness and disease away from thy midst. Then nothing shall cast their young or barren in the land and the number of thy days I will fulfill. He didn't say you're not going to die. He said I will heal you while you're here. It's part of the deal to be healed while you live here. You'll die. Amen. Everybody will die. You know God put the breath in. I'm sure one day he could take it out. You know what I'm saying? So he, you're not going to have a problem dying but you're going to have to know some things to stay healthy while you're here. Amen. Amen. The will. We have said this before, you know, I've said this in other sermons, read the will, right? The last will and testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was the tester. In other words, he wrote the will, right? Jesus wrote the will. After he was raised from the dead, he became the mediator of the will, mediator. A mediator if you're in negotiations means this is what it represents. He talks to God and he talks to you. So he mediates the connection. He literally 
negotiates the connection for you. He sits at the right hand of the Father. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. You got to get the if out. You got to get the if. 2 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. There's one negotiator for your healing it's Him. By His stripes, you were healed. He wrote the will and he became the negotiator of the will. So he did both sides of your healing. Both sides. He wrote the will and he negotiated the will for you. I think it's great. He wrote the will and he negotiates the will. He's the mediator that connects you to your promise. My God. He connects you to your promise. Healing, whatever it is, prosperity, whatever it is, he connects you to your promise. Like I said, just remember your salvation. The same way you got saved is how you get healed. You confess with the mouth, believe in your heart, and God's power manifests. After he was raised from the dead, he became the mediator to go between. Now, who has the right? This is the one, that, the question you have to ask yourself. Since he did it, who has the right to change the will? Who's power? Nobody. There's nobody that can change the will because he's watching over it and he's the mediator of it. So anything less than what he negotiated and less than what he provided is a, not enjoying the benefits of an our inheritance. This might be boring, but isn't it if you need it? If you, were, if you were sick and you were getting a foundation for this, it's not boring. In other words, it's paid for, it's negotiated, it's done. Your prayers change when you see things as done. They totally change if you see them as done. You're not trying to get something. You've already got it. You don't got to go get it. It's already yours. Jesus on the cross said it's finished. You know, I was raised Catholic. You know, we had to do penance and Hail Marys and everything. But it didn't do anything because it was already done. I just had to receive the forgiveness. It was done. It's done. Jesus finished the work. He's trying to help you enter into what he has for you. It's, it's my will takes the if out of the equation. I wonder if I'm going to get healed. I wonder if, I wonder if I did enough good works. I wonder the if is gone when he says, I will. It removes the doubt. And we all know this, you know, in Exodus, in Exodus 3, 14, he said, I am that I am. Now, did God change since he said, I am that I am? So he's the same one. God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thou shalt say to the children of Israel, as sent me to you. He's the same God and has not changed. I am what I am. I'll always be what I am. I won't change. And I will bless your bread and water, remove sickness and disease from your midst. It's not, I've done it. It's non-negotiable. I negotiated it. I paid for it. It's done. The father and I got an agreement. He's going to do it because of me. And I know you don't deserve it, but you're getting it because I went to the cross, suffered, died, and was buried and raised again on the third day. So what I got is for you. Isn't that nice to know? Amen. He tasted death for every man. That's what the Bible says. He tasted death for every man. That means all people. Every man is every nationality and every man that's ever been born. Not some man, every man. He, he went from Jews to Gentiles, you know. 
You know, it's so funny. This is why I always, I ride this horse a little bit lately because the news kind of bothers me and prejudice has always bothered me. But you think about it. I mean, who do men think they are to decide what a man's color should be or his nationality would be when God made them all? I mean, you talk about high-minded. How can you get so high-minded to even consider that somebody was born the wrong color or the wrong race or nationality? It's, it's absurd. It's crazy. It's like saying God made a mistake and got out the wrong cram that day. Now, you laugh, but that's almost, it's an insult to think that God didn't know what he did as if he forgot something. It's a, that's why you know prejudice is from hell because it makes this much sense. No sense. And nationality issues, you know, don't make sense either. I grew up in Nationalityville. You know, everybody was a different nationality in my town. They were from all over the world and some people didn't like each other, some did. And I think some of it came from old country, from Europe and the prejudice they brought over with them and they didn't like each other for no reason. I'm thinking, you don't even know them. You never talked to them. How could you, not, how could you dislike them? You, don't even know they're, you never talked to them for more than a minute. But all those preconceived ideas and all that hatred, you, you can have some really, really bad people. Once the devil gets into people, they do really, really bad things. They actually think that they are the dominant race and they're willing to kill everybody that's not like them. That's how far it can go. That's pretty strong, isn't it? To think you're so great that everybody should die but you. Anyway, so uh, he tasted death for every man. See, that's why your healing is really uh, something he gave you and not something you can attain. You can't attain a healing. You just receive it. You know, I battled low self-esteem almost all my life, you know, and I always felt like I didn't deserve so many things, so this was a real challenge for me to even think that he's gonna give it to me just because he loves me. But that's the only reason. And it's part of the covenant, it's part of the New, new Testament, the will. The New Testament is the will of God for the New Covenant. And your healing is in there, not because you did anything, but because of his sacrifice and his blood.